Um, welcome to the University of Toronto <clears throat> Joint Centre for Bioethics seminar series. My name is Jay Shaw. I'll be the moderator for today's session. And our speaker is Dr. Carlo Botrugno. And this seminar is entitled Digital Health and Telemedicine, Lessons from the Past, Current Trends and New Challenges. And before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to let you know that the seminar is being recorded. Um, this lecture, along with other archived lectures, can be accessed through the Joint Center for Bioethics YouTube page. Uh, the format for the seminar is a presentation by our speaker, followed by a facilitated discussion. Um, and uh, before moving on, I I'd like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today, uh, it's a meeting place that is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And uh, I am very grateful to have the opportunity to live and work here. So now it's my pleasure to introduce um, our speaker, Dr. Carlo Botrugno. He has a PhD in law and new technologies, a master in law, uh, and he graduated uh, in graduate school in social work and legal studies, all from the University of Bologna. He created and currently coordinates the research unit on everyday bioethics and ethics of science at the Department of Legal Sciences at the University of Florence, where he works as an assistant professor in, in philosophy of law and bioethics. He's responsible for the law clinic and bioethics at University of Florence, director of the newly established book series, Contemporary Challenges in Bioethics, and editor in chief <clears throat> of uh, <clears throat> academic journal, uh, L'Altro Dorito. Uh, he's, he's an associate researcher at the European Oncological Institute in Milan, and he's recognized as an expert on uh, the ethical, legal, and social implications of telemedicine and di digital health, and has conducted research on this topic in, in several European countries and Latin American countries. Uh, in parallel, he is committed to shedding light on the interplay of bioethics and racism, which includes racism and discrimination in healthcare, healthcare justice, and health and healthcare inequalities. So Carlo, on behalf of the JCB, please welcome. Thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, okay, for this um, opportunity, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thanks to for all of you, for all the person that contributed to to setting up this event, this talk. And uh, yes, basically, um, I've been working uh, kind of 15 years. I'm working for 15 years on this uh, issue of the, the telemedicine and digital health from a bioethics perspective. Uh, so I'm trying today to, to put together several pieces of my work all over these years. Uh, I'm not here to show, uh, so don't expect the the the, uh, the last trend, the very the cutting edge of AI of telemedicine, because I think this is quite uh, you you can get to know uh, elsewhere. Uh, it's easy to to have an idea of what is going on, but I'm more uh, interested in uh, stopping a little bit the 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 discourse that is going on to think uh, to offer some critical thought on on several. Uh, issues and aspects that are related to bioethics and medical ethics when it comes to the implementation of ICTs in clinical practice. So let's start. I used to to uh, start by giving an idea of the many countless opportunities provided today by information and communication technologies. Of course, I do that because not always are uh, are familiar with with the with this universe uh, but as you can see and you probably know already know about the many many possibilities that we have today at reach and most importantly one of one of the the most important thing is the creation of ne these new flows of data that uh, are going to be collected and stored and reused for further purpose so uh, representing the basis of decision for the future of healthcare policies in our uh, in our healthcare systems so what does what was the context that brought um, industrialized 
countries to afford on the ICTs. Uh, of course, we have a we had an, an issue of uh, aging population and increase and the increase re, and the related increase of chronic disease. Also, we had a, a problem with uh, inequalities because uh, even industrialized area industrialized areas uh, we don't not all the part of of counties are uh, equally covered by healthcare services. Then there is an, a, a matter of accessibility to those services because uh, even if when services healthcare services, services are available, uh, not all the people have the same level of uh, ability, the skills to to access them in a for for the good of uh, in adequate way. And then there is also uh, the the issue of a new conception of health uh, being emerged over the last decades, uh, as the WHO stigmatized several decades ago uh, about health not being just the absence of disease. And this is actually happening because today uh, health is becoming a, a big uh a catch-all uh, category for including not just uh, the pure notion of healthcare delivery, but other overlapping notions such as well-being, wellness, uh, sometimes even entertainment. And this is a big challenge for healthcare system because we uh, we see that we the healthcare system have uh, ever less resources and have more and more uh, things that they have to guarantee to their patients to their population. So when in, in over there in Europe, in the European Union, uh, particularly the European Commission uh, uh, has put a lot of efforts to promote the implementation of ICTs in um, daily practice. So this is somehow some pieces of the digital strategy, uh, which was for a long time was named Aging Well with ICTs. Now it's more generally being relabeled as digital strategy in the European Union. And uh, of course, we have seen a lot of efforts uh, during the pandemic to fostering the digital transition of healthcare uh, here in North America. Uh, several initiatives have been adopted, but also in Europe, some some emergency strategies. I'm, I'm from Italy, where one of the um, one of the first industrialized countries have been seriously hit by the pandemic. And the Italian government, for instance, tried to, to adopt an emergency strategy to digitalize healthcare, which was completely a failure. Uh, but yes, basically, those countries who have already, before the pandemic, already a, a policy for telemedicine and digital health have afforded on the benefits of that, while the other countries have just uh, adopted some last minute strategies. Of course, we know the benefits. Uh, of uh, of those services during during the pandemic, during the viral outbreak, uh, continuity to healthcare delivery, safeguarding patients and professional, prevented a lot of unnecessary hospitalization, allowing remote monitoring of patient status, allow quarantine professional to continue to work from home, and provide support to people affected by psychological psychological distress. So when it comes to consider the 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 universe of ICTs in the healthcare. The first very dimension that emerged uh, the, over the past century was telemedicine, mostly in the United States. And uh, after that, the, the, the other one was telemonitoring. This, this I'm trying to moving. Yeah. So they, they were the first, uh, the first two dimensions that emerged, and it was clear the difference between the two. But then we have seen a lot a proliferation of terms and dimension uh, that somehow make confusion because, uh, in some sense, they refer to very specific uh, dimension of healthcare digitally uh, mediated healthcare delivery, and somehow they overlap. For instance. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty from an ethical and legal point of view because you're, it's not always easy to understand uh, what is telecare, what is telemedicine, what is telehealth, what is telehealth care, uh, if it's just remote care or if you, it's an integration of um, a both with the, a bot with the, um, with the human expertise 
when you're talking to a bot and when you're talking to, to, the, to the human and so on. So from an ethical and legal point of view, this is a big, uh, um, a big challenge and also a, a barrier to the development of this, uh, uh, to the spread of these services in daily practice. And of course, from this, uh, a lot of uh, ethical and legal issues arise, uh, such uh, I put here just the most important, I would say, maybe you will find more, but basically we have uh, many qualitative studies that uh, raise the issue of surveillance or the aptitude of these services to catch uh, aspects of uh, personal life which are not necessarily related to, to the healthcare delivery purpose. Then of course, safety of technological devices, ac accessibility of data collected by that means, who is allowed to, uh, who is not. Uh, the risk that though the use of devices, technological devices could uh, increase the uh, dependence from, from users, particularly from users that suffer from social isolation and so on. The reliability of measurement, the accuracy of, uh, that have been uh, realized through these devices. There's a matter of task redistribution in the clinical settings because uh, evidence show that um, Many tasks that were before that in conventional care are, com are conferred usually were conferred to uh, physicians are now more and more shift with digital health to nurses and registered nurses. There's a matter of liability, of course, also as a consequence of this. Uh, as I said before, uh, accessibility of service, even when when services are available, no need to say privacy and data protection, and also. Uh, probably the first uh, aspect that emerged uh, with the very beginning of telemedicine, with the emergence of telemedicine, is this discourse about the dehumanization issue. So if those services contribute or not to, to dehumanizing uh, healthcare delivery, we'll see something about this in the in, later. So to let me say, to the best of my knowledge in this uh, in this domain, I will I see two main trends that intersect uh, and, and, and create some, some effects, I will see. The first is the virtualization and digitalization. Somehow, sometimes this term is used interchangeably, uh, but basically we have two things. You're virtualizing, so you're replacing human expertise with the, with the algorithm, with the, with the uh, technological tools. And then there is the digitalization, which means uh, you are uh, put, you are overcoming a distance between patients, between users, and professional through digital means, which would be the case of telemedicine. But I, I, as I say, sometimes uh, people refer to virtualizing when they want to say digitalizing, and 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 vice versa. And then there is the 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 paradigm of the information informational medicine or the medicine based on, on data on numbers uh, which was always present because medicine has always afforded always afforded on numbers on data but more and more with the development of ICT means there is this huge availability of data which have been re reprocessed uh, and used for secondary purpose so there's an increasing importance of this trend. And what do they these trends uh, how they affect I would say the 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 some of the pillar of medical practice and healthcare delivery today I just identified this we could maybe add more but to my to 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 the to my experience in my experience these are the most important doctor patient relation the role of patient the role of clinicians and the emergence of new forms of knowledge. So let's see, let yeah let's see uh, the first uh, which is the no this is general more than the, just related to the first I I like to to stop a little bit and think what was the the evolution of modern medicine from the ancient Greek to 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 current times so we know that very ancient in ancient Greek there were uh, Asclepius, there was Asclepius and uh, his sons and uh, his daughters uh, that were conferred some curative powers and uh, he himself was created to be the god of medicine. 
one of the descendants, one of the the the, the yeah, one of the descendants of uh, of the Asclepius was uh, Hippocrates, who created was is credited to be the founder of modern medicine of the biomedical paradigm, which uh, separated the the ritual, the magical, uh, the the ascetical from what is just uh, visible on the on the body of patients, and this trend uh, to 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 collect to go for the evidence. Uh, was really um, increased during the in, during the Renaissance age, particularly in Italy, uh, with the liberalization of the section practices. The physician, the clinician, started to look into the body, uh, to to conceive the body as a as a fabric. So they wanted to discover the mechanism how the that work uh, how that body works. And with uh, the scientific revolution of Galileo de Galilei, uh, still in that period. Uh, somehow this trend was uh, brought to the higher level because uh, thinkers such as Galileo Galilei and Descartes uh, introduced this mathematic vision of the world. So we know very well the, the metaphor of the Descartes as body machine, which turned the human body into a kind of clockwork and placed for the first time, I would say, a, a distance, not just between soul of the body, so the soul as rest, uh, cogitants and the body as res extensa, but also between patients, complaint, and physicians' eye. In that case, in because of that, uh, disease started to be seen as a damage that could be fixed through pharmacological and surgical intervention, and the taxonomy of diseases became possible. The prestigious of the number was. Uh, still uh, as its root in this uh, in this period of in the historical period because uh, thinkers as Bacon and Leibniz started to search for methods for numera numerifying life. So uh, this was of course because of the charm of the of this mathematic vision of the world, but they wanted to create a new language, some kind of universal language that could be. Uh, without any imperfection, without any mistake, a, a language that could be shared uh, ecumenically, universally. So they sought for method of codify, codification of sorry, codification of the living of the life, uh, which will have an unprecedented impact on, uh, on course, uh, on every aspect of social life, but also on the medical epistemology, marking this transition from what was called as what 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 was considered to be the mechanical paradigm of medicine to the informational one. So here I added some other pieces to, to, to this puzzle. Of course, I know when it comes to the evolution of modern medicine, there's a lot of steps more that should be included. But let's say that to, to, in my perspective, these are the most functional to my discourse. and. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to remark that until a few decades ago, a very few decades ago, the biggest source of knowledge for a physician were just the five senses. So they just relied on what they could touch, hear, smell, and eat even uh, from, from the body. So the, the main source of the knowledge from, from a physician was the body. So hearing the body, touching the body, smelling the body, and everything. Uh, with some technological innovation like the first stethoscope, uh, there was a, a, an enhancement of the human abilities for hearing. So this the stethoscope uh, reshaped the sensorial hierarchy of the of the medical practice. The, the, the first, the most important sense was seeing before stethoscope. Uh, after the stethoscope was hearing because the the stethoscope allowed to to an increased power of the hearing into the body. Then, of course, other in technological technological innovation, like, such as the X-rays invention, that, which completely shape uh, the diagnostic process uh, with the with the with the development of medical imaging. There will be many other steps from the med from the medical imaging to to the digital health we have seen before. But basically, I would like to remark that today we have seen for the first time. Uh, with digital health, uh, uh, the activation, a digital activation of passion. So it's passion for the first time is required to do something. Is uh, He has the power to do something, uh, which was not before, was a, a, a passive object of, 
of uh, knowledge extracted from their body. So the, this completely reshaped also the role of patients. And when it comes to uh, the, the dehumanization issue of which is mostly, let's say it's as primarily emerges with telemedicine, but then also been attracted to, to some extent by the, the, the whole discourse on digital health. Uh, this is a picture I took uh, from my from my, an ethnography that I did in a teleorthopedic consult consultation service. So this is the the scenario that we have to consider when we talk about is this dehumanizing or not? Is it, is this better equivalent or inferior to to standard care? And the research I I did in that time was really funny. I'm going to to share something of this more uh, afterward, uh, but it really allowed me to to enter into the into the into the hyper context of the virtuality because in my point of view that was the the composition of three different contexts it was the con the physical context in the where the patient was standing the physical context where i was with the physician and the virtuality that shapes both contexts so the mutual interaction between these three contexts just designed and what i call a hyper context so according to Lely, to literature, uh, the lack of in-person interaction can be dehumanizing because humans are sensible beings, are able to perceive their world according to touch, to smell, sound, vision, speak. So when you lose someone, some of these capabilities, you just are in a vulnerable state that threatens to diminish the trust of the situation. And also because the body expresses the richness and complexity of one's identity through many forms of communication, both verbally and non-verbally. But for some other, the lack of impression, the lack of in-person interaction is not necessarily dehumanizing because the remote services enable the establishment of a kind of social presence, which is defined as the action, understanding, and confirmation that appear to result from being there, which means being present and having available a number of modalities and clues that influence communication. And also remote services uh, are credited to empowering patients, encouraging them to reduce the sense of discomfort, which is typical of uh, some conventional uh, physical consultation. Uh, this was uh, mostly related to telepsychiatry, so in the field of, in the field of, of psychiatry. Um, there are some tools available uh, at international level, some ethical tools that uh, that um, tries to give some tips and recommendations on for to deal with the, this uh, issue from an ethical point of view. Uh, the WMA statement on the ethics of telemedicine, which is regularly updated, kind of uh, two years, if I'm not wrong. And then there is also this. There's this other tool uh, which has been promoted by the European Commission a few years ago, the International Code of Practice for Telehealth Services. More or less the content is, is, is the same of the two instruments, so I'm just focusing on some uh, recommendations taken from the statement for the WH, WMA statement on the ethics of telemedicine. So, of course, as you can see, Patient physician relationship should be based when you when you practice in, in telemedicine on a personal examination and sufficient knowledge of the patient medical history. Telemedicine should be employed primarily in situations in which a physician cannot be physically present within a safe and acceptable time period. Uh, the patient physician relationship must be based on mutual trust and respect. It is essential that physician and patient be able to identify each other reliably when telemedicine is employed. Physician must be aware that certain telemedicine technologies could be unaffordable to patient and hence impede access, uh, inequitable access to telemedicine further widen the health outcomes gap between the poor and rich. And then among the, the, the ones that I selected, uh, the physician should exercise their professional autonomy in deciding whether a telemedicine versus face-to-face -face consultation is appropriate. Uh, in my experience uh, doing uh, ethnography in, in, in telemedicine, uh, which has been a tremendously enriching experience. So I, I had the opportunity to, to see very funny things and a lot of findings. Um, 
So, uh, first of all, I would say it was really interesting to me to see how uh, I was skeptical about the, the 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 humanization of telemedicine before of doing this this research before doing my field work, but then I found myself almost crying uh, beside the the physician uh, during some teleconsultation because I had the lucky to stay beside beside some physicians were really really able to to touch the heart of the person uh, beyond the screen. So they really established a strong connection uh, with, with emotion passing from the, from the even, even involving me because I was just staying there silent without doing, without doing nothing and without saying nothing. But at the same time, I been assisting to some consultation that were kind of police interrogation. So uh, the, the vision just stand in front of the screen and say, are you the patient named da, 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 da? and the patient say, uh, yes. Uh, do you have this problem? Uh, yes. So th the patient was frightened, really. It's, it's a, was a very uncomfortable situation for them. All of the, all of the gesture of the, the speaking, the voice was communicating that discomfort. And uh, of course, uh, this, you can, you can say that was a, a good quality interaction from uh, from uh, from my point of view i would say general but also when you when it comes to to the the basic criteria of medical ethics so this uh gave me the idea that not necessarily is not the means the technological means that necessarily they humanize or not the interaction between passion and and, and uh, a physician it is more the soft skill is this more the ability of passion to enter in contact with some of the with the with the uh, you know with the interior of passion with establishing with working on some on some issue related like, oh what do, did you you're following our dietary are you eating pizza or pasta just skip the uh, don't need that much fat please just smile you know those small talks that helps a lot to to create those familiarity. Instead, if you just take the screen as a, as a means to 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 uh, to to convey the information, it is really something uh, frightening. Uh, so this is one of the findings that I found out: uh, the training, the ability of a physician, the soft skill of physician, uh, are really fundamental to uh, to provide good quality telemedicine interaction. Then, when it comes more generally to role of passion in in digitalization processes, uh, I'm sharing this episode uh, that uh, this personal episode. I was invited uh, a few years ago in this uh, meeting, in this expert meeting by the WHO, the Regional Office of Europe. I was in Slovakia at that time, and uh, uh, there was uh, the we were working on this kind of roadmap to fostering the digitalization of national healthcare systems. And there, there was someone who, who at some point uh, stood out and said, we must make health information accessible to anyone, anytime, without having them to see a doctor. And everybody clapped and said, oh, that's good. We have to push this. We have to... So I was the only one with ethical background, let me say, and I was completely uh, not on my ease with that. And I raised my hand and say, look, uh, I would like to, to, to reflect a little bit more on this idea because it, because this, this could be, of course, this idea of empowering uh, can be ambivalent, you know, you uh, can be a driver to, to many other negative repercussions and so on. And uh, well, there is also, everybody looks at me like, uh, what, what does he say? I mean, you're really... At the end, uh, I was not included anymore in those meetings. <laughs> but uh, taking seriously the issue, the, the, the fact of turning, of empowering those patients from a digital perspective. Of course, bioethics has always been concerned with this. The, probably the, the most important goal of bioethics is the enhancement of patient rights patient values, 
expectation, preferences, autonomies, and so on. So, but we have to consider it a bit how this digital activation, uh, what this digital activation means from a bioethics perspective. Uh, I use the notion of the homo medicus, uh, which was, uh, I think it was coined by this scholar, this French scholar, uh, which refers to an individual who is expected to be even more responsible for their own health by engaging in activities of prevention or constant monitoring of vital parameters. And I call it in digital terms, so the homo medical digitalis, so an individual is expected to be even more responsible for their own health, leveraging the opportunities of digital health and telemedicine. And in my perspective, this uh, idea of the homo medicus uh, can really evoke a kind of new paradigm uh, which refer to a notion of health as potentially always incomplete or I say in suspension. In other words, you are uh, healthy, but you can be even more healthy. Or you are not sick, uh, but you can be sick anytime. So it's a kind of constant infra pathologization. And uh, despite this paradigm uh, fits the idea, the utopian idea of achievement of a total health, uh, this contributes to shift the core of healthcare organization from the state of health to a condition of risk. And here, the focus of care is not anymore on policies, public policies and services organization, uh, but more on lifestyles, attitude, behaviors, and choices, which is a rationality uh, mirroring the work of many, many scholars, of course, but the particular I chose uh, Foucault, uh, which uh, remark this idea of the self-entrepreneurs or managers of their own health. And here, the point is that the health of the population is ever less a state duty, is ever less a concern of the public sphere and even more a personal responsibility or ability. So when what, what happens when, uh, when it comes to personal responsibility or personal ability to deal with health? We, as we have seen with, during the pandemic, which has been unfortunately a big lab for, uh, for understanding more because we knew already the mechanism related to, to the production of inequality in care and healthcare. Um, um, basically we have seen that uh, some social groups uh, or what, what is being called racialized or minorities, I don't like that much this term, but uh, because of, of that other work that I'm doing. But we have seen that basically some, some groups uh, face it, uh, increased risk of being infected by the virus, increased risk of dying from the virus, increased um, problems in dealing with the socioeconomic consequence of the virus and so on. So there was this sociopathogenic circle that affected some population groups. And when you go for the interplay of uh, when you're considering the, 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 the burden of um, digital divide, we already know that there is several levels of digital divides that impede the, the plain access to, to, that could impede the plain access to the benefits of digital health. Uh, the first, the most important is still the, the lack of internet access and related technologies. Then we, there, there is the, the knowledge divide uh, or the lack of skills and knowledge to use properly those new services. And then there is agency, uh, which encompasses many other contextual factors that could affect our, our ability to using these new technologies. And when you, inter when you look at the interplay of health inequalities and digital divides, you basically see that they just mirror each other. And this is mostly because digital solutions are designed for people who already possess this uh, set of uh, soft skill, you know, uh, health skills. So basically uh, awareness, attention, uh, self-discipline, that those skills that allow, allow people to use the services for better health outcome. And these skills are the result, are the product of formal education. So they refer to, uh, do, to cognitive and behavioral habits that are being, uh, uh, um, learned and adapted from peers in, in social contexts. The notion of digital health literacy, for instance, uh, really uh, give, gives us an idea 
of this uh, interplay because it's it has been referred as the ability to see to find to understand and appraise health information from electronic sources and apply them to to deal with problem in the health field when it comes to the uh, role of clinician which has been somehow uh, reshaped by the digitalization process of course uh, the first thing you have to consider is the the need for digital skills uh, which is more of course this is not a really a problem of uh, younger generation new new uh, younger physician uh, supposedly do not have any problem with that, but we have a lot of practitioners today that, uh, of course, mm, I would say more or less all of them know how to input data into a computer, use the smartphone and everything. But for instance, let's consider the burden of this, uh, how to deal, how to use, for instance, the, 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 the entry of data and, mm, taking care of a person at the same time, or how much this uh, managing of the technologies uh, affect the, the, the burden of uh, daily practice for these people. So we have to consider a little bit more what is the impact of digitalization process in daily, in the daily routine of this professional. And also, of course, we have to, as I said before, with my research findings, the, those care virtualization or digitalization skills. So not all of them, I would say, most of them are not really prepared to take care virtually, to, to transmit positive sensation to patients, to receive uh, th those from patients in a, in a very systematic way. Of course, we you have people who are very well uh, are, are prepared to do that, are ready to do that, just because it's they have special sensitivity, they have special skills, but it's just random, you know, we, you cannot afford on, on this on an individual way, should prepare all of them to, to offer those kind of skills. And it's not a chance, it's not a coincidence that many scholars talk about the need for this figure, the virtualist, the medical virtualist, someone who is trained specifically to deal with the virtual environment in healthcare and the digitalization. And then there is the problematic relation of, of, uh, uh, of the human expertise with data or with the uh, results of uh, automated prediction, for instance. So basically we have three scenarios. I, I assume that you are already uh, familiar with that. So basically when you integrate them, clinician may be required, for instance, just to follow AI results, even if they are not, uh, even, even if they don't agree with them. Clinician may use uh, um, um, AI results as a supplementary tool, uh, or clinicians are just left free to rely or not on AI results. So basically, depending on the on what is uh, what is established as an interaction between the human knowledge and the, and the results of data, uh, you have different scenario in which the physician could be responsible or could take the initiative to say, uh, in, in my knowledge, this is not relevant, or according to my vision, to, to, the, to the perspective I have, this could be not the case for this uh, prediction and so on. So this is a, a, a very... Mm, uh, tricky uh, issue that we we have to deal with when we when we consider the integration of AI with the human uh, practice of medicine, and this is uh, one of the work we have done in uh, uh, taking the case from uh, clinical decision making in uh, palliative medicine, the ethical challenges because is one of the example where there is a lot of talking about the integration of these tools to fostering better care, to improving efficiency and so on. But at the end, uh, the, the fact of just this idea of replacing part of the process that is already, uh, already makes sense in that, uh, in that uh, sphere, sphere of care, it is really dangerous because you cannot just, even if those uh, tools provide a much higher accuracy than any other human, you cannot think of just replying uh, 
uh, that tools with the, all of the factors that are involved in the delivery of palliative care or starting a conversation at the end of life care. So there is, for instance, uh, catching the autonomy, the quality of life, the conversation involved into that, uh, the sharing with the patients about the 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 possibility of worsening the healthcare status, the psycho psychosocial and spiritual distress about just initiating this conversation or not. So there is a, a huge series of factors you should consider. And you cannot just replace uh, the prediction, the mortality prediction with this need to trigger end of life care conversation. And when it comes to the new forms of knowledge, of course, we are very well aware about the, the health data as the center of the so-called informational medicine. Uh, and also we know that uh, about the vulnerability of health data and the importance from an ethical and a legal point of view. Of course, we see that privacy violation and breath data are increasing and there is, this trend is somehow unavoidable as insofar as the, the, the spread of these services is uh, is increasing. So the strategies that will be adopted to mitigate the risk will be fundamental, of course, to protect patients' rights. Um, but from a legal point of view, I would say from a better saying from a philosophical legal point of view, when I started to work on the, on the right to health in the digital era, I just uh, I just feel like that was uh, not enough uh, to make a list of the issue. You know, you, in many publications, you just see, okay, there is this uh, autonomy issue, privacy issue, a list. In my perspective, that that uh, method, that uh, way of uh, framing the the situation, is really derived from the influence of principalism in bioethics. So you just said that, that that those clusters. So I tried to think uh, to more holistic approach to deal with the with the consequence of digitalization process and the interplay of digitalization on on right to health. So I never I use it um, to to refer to three uh, fundamental factors that uh, that a new approach to to this topic will need to do to to afford on. The first is a critical attitude to the legal test to policy making and so on because. Even in Europe, there's a lot of policy making. We have seen the, the strategy, the digital strategy of the European Union. But the European Union at the end is just a political entity. They just they are they make choice about so so it's not uh, something that we can disregard on. And sometimes we really, really consider the policy making of the European Union as something well, it's always good because it's the European Union, but we just forget that there's a European Parliament, there's a European Commission, and they make decisions about our life. So for instance, when it comes to telemedicine, they were pushing a lot telemedicine, even in times where there were no evidence at all about the efficacy of telemedicine, the quality of telemedicine, the ethical compliance of telemedicine with medical ethics and so on. And this was quite disregarded in the, in the policy making process in, in the digital strategy. Of course, we need an ethical background because we talk about very sensitive issue when it comes to, to these digital healthcare services. And also we need a strong interdisciplinarity because uh, I've always thought that we have to take evidence, the best of the evidence from all of the fields that are involved when it comes to, 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 to this uh, sphere. So medical anthropology, sociology, philosophy, ethics, law, and so on. And at theoretical level, I afforded on this uh, approach of the sociomaterialism. Uh, I don't know if you are uh, familiar with that, but really making simple, it refers to uh, a complex assemblages resulting from the interaction among bodies, knowledge, ideas, discourses, spaces and material objects. So this uh, framework just try to put together the material and the non-material, the virtual and the, and, and the material. So uh, it was perfect for my perspective because it also overlaps some other minor, uh, minor, more or less minor, the STS science and technology studies are not that minor, really strong, particularly here, but also the legal geography perspective, which is 
which is, uh, has been established here in the United States, sorry, uh, in North America. Not, I don't know if probably most in the United States, but generally in North America. And um, the legal geography is really concerned with the where of the law. So it cares about the implication of spatiality and the law, the implication of the legal provision on the space. So where does this approach lead to? Uh, this to this new geo to the new definition uh, that I described in terms of a new geography of right to health or a set of individual prerogatives, expectations, opportunities, and risk resulting from the combination of conventional healthcare with the ubiquitousness of the ICTs. And this confers a new a renewed relevance to ge geographical and special aspects of healthcare organization. And one of the things that this new approach will lead to is uh, rethinking the, the, uh, the power, the notion of power of data and digitalization. Uh, and when I talk about the power, I, I refer to the work of Michel Foucault, uh, when they say that we, we used to, to consider power as something just negative, power that oppresses and reprimes and so on, but we should shift our perspective and, and also consider that power produces, that power produces reality, that produces domains of objects and rituals of truth. So the individual and the knowledge that may be gained of him belongs of this production. So this principle of production uh, really inspired my, my idea, my, my work that I was doing on the digitalization process when it comes to the new form of knowledge, because of course we have seen that the in the digitalization brings this uh, putting beside some form of knowledge, for instance, the knowledge that physicians would take from the body and creating some new knowledge, knowledge of data, knowledge taken from the processing, the further processing of data and so on. So I uh, try to uh, convey these new forms of power and knowledge in basically in two concepts, the digital cartography, cartographies of the body because the body is more and more reduced, reduced into signs, into fragments, and archived in the virtual space, and therefore it becomes accessible an infinite number of times and by countless subjects. And the digitalization of this representation can be further converted into data, so numbers, which are susceptible of, again, new sharing, reusage, and further processing. And also the new topographies of health, which, um, it comes from the dissolution, from the blurring of the boundaries between the materiality and virtuality. Again, uh, taking the work of Foucault, uh, we cannot con we cannot look at healthcare delivery anymore with the fixity and solidity of healthcare institution because you now healthcare healthcare delivery is not anymore. It's not does not consider anymore with the with those institutions, you know, with the buildings. You go to the hospital and you take and you're accessing some healthcare. You can access healthcare from any anywhere uh, with digital health apps. And so these topographies act as networks that involve patients together with other material and non-material factors, such as space, places, distances, technologies, and the whole lot also, the knowledge itself. So in conclusion, uh, to, to, to make a summary of these trends, new trends, lessons from the past. Uh, digital health and telemedicine, in my point of view, the, to the knowledge that I have just overlapped the reductionism of biomedical paradigm, therefore reflect its main ambivalence, which is uh, uh, filtering the data uh, which uh, that clinicians have a disposal for their diagnostic and, and creating therapy. So, uh, the, the whole history of medicine was a history of uh, cutting what was relevant for, for, the, for the physician to make a diagnostic. So uh, even more objectified knowledge, uh, even more a knowledge which is transmissible, which is convertible into data, into numbers and so on. And the digitalization, virtualization of healthcare runs along the proliferation of health data, of course, which in inevitably leads to lessening the human balances and compassion of care in daily practice. But still the presence of doctors is fundamental for them to make sense about some, let's, let's call them technical details, such as symptoms, medical prescription, and so on. And this is really fundamental for establishing an effective therapeutic alliance. 
And finally, of course, an ethics of digital health and telemedicine can help to guide the implementation and balance advantages with drawbacks, therefore keeping the standard of quality of medical practice high. Thank you so much. Stand here. Uh, I mean, th thank you so much. That's that's great. Um, uh, an impressive body of work leading up to a, a few sort of very interesting directions for your future work that I'm looking forward to hearing more about. Um, so just for everybody tuning in online, so we have only a few minutes for questions. So if you have a question, you can put it into the YouTube chat. Um, if you'd prefer to ask your question anonymously, you can email uh, jcb.ea at utoronto.ca. And I believe that's going to be put in the chat as well. Um, so, you know, I, we do have time for a couple of questions. I have a couple of my own, but I'll look to the room first if, if there's a question on the top of anybody's mind. Yeah, Jennifer, please. So thank you for a wonderful talk. I, I really appreciated how you approach this, this topic through multiple disciplinary perspectives and it, the richness really shows up. One of the things that I that struck me, just going back to your earlier comments about sort of the, the, the history of medicine, one that sort of had this mathematical model, right? So the clockwork. And, it, and yet where you ended here with the digitization is almost again, a return of the, the body as data points, as, as uh, something about which we can inquire through mathematics, we can model. It's just such an interesting observation that there's in a sense a bit of a return. But I wondered if you might, and I, I, I'm wondering if what we're also seeing is a bit of a return particularly with the introduction of artificial intelligence, where it, the data becomes in a way inaccessible because it's, it's uh, we don't necessarily understand what's going on. The, like the mystery, it's almost like return, the return of alchemy, where the mystery of what the AI is producing, we can't always go back to figure out how it got there. So it's based on data but it doesn't have the same, we think about um, generative AI is hallucinating, that's mysterious. And so we can't audit it in the same way. So I wonder if, you know, the historical arc of this is, it, I find interesting, but I wonder if there's something here too, that it ch changes a relationship of trust. It calls on us to have greater trust in the technology and the people using it in ways that is also shaped, shifting that relationship. I don't know if that's entirely clear, but I'm just, it's, it strikes me that there's a lot going on that is hard to wrap our, our, our senses around. Thanks, that's a, that's a very interesting remark. Uh, yeah, this kind of, uh, if I can use maybe this term, this expression of black box. Yeah. Uh, the AI technology and the data uh, production. Uh, Yes, um, we somehow uh, give those, uh, the result of this processing the value of objectivity, uh, yeah. something which is always superior to the human, but we forget the social shaping that, uh, that, uh, that lead to the, to the, uh, to the uh, creation of, of those tools that allowed that processing to, to create new knowledge. So I think we should uh, retrieve a little bit the, the idea that medicine is a social science, so medical knowledge is socially shaped, and what we know is not what we what was outside there and we just discover. It's it's just that we create the knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, even let me say, I'm, I don't know if I can say this here. Uh, I'm somehow disappointed by many many debates, many discussion about the AI the, the the superiority of AI and therapeutic debate is just AI was always in the history of medicine, always been information, numbers, algorithm, and so on. To a different extent, of course, for that reason specifically, and thank you for, for remarking that I went to Galileo Galilei and the mathematical vision of the world, because we just forget the history of medicine. It was always this way. Of course, that path has allowed the biomedical parting to reach level of efficacy that were unknown in the past, you know? but 
what we have lose from that we just forget the, that the medicine was also something else and now it's not anymore we don't that now nobody i think this i don't know if you have your really the experience of physician today touching you when you are you're sick it's, it's it's really likely to happen you know because the body is not anymore the main source of knowledge it's something else is the screen but the body still has a has something to say it still would have and also uh, taking care from for the body from the for the person is something that has its value from uh, from empathy from proximity intimacy and all this can have an implication also from, from a psychosocial psychosocial point of view so, you're not any audience i don't know if i no it's no i'm just, just exploring it together it's a wonderful thoughts yeah thank yeah, you very much it's great thanks carlo uh, just given the time and to, to be respectful of people's time and the, those who've joined online as well, I think um, we'll, we'll call the session to a close and then certainly we'll have some cont continue our conversation, Carlo. So um, just a couple quick announcements before we thank our, our speaker. Our next seminar next week uh, will take place April 24th, which will feature Dr. Claudia Barnad and uh, her, her colleague uh, Aku, um, Akoswa Nwafor. And they'll be discussing their project titled, I Don't Want Any Black Nurses, Insights from the Academic Literature and Ontario's Regulatory Bodies on Navigating Discriminatory Requests or Refusals of Care Providers. So to sign up to receive our weekly seminar reminder and event digest emails, please email jcb.info at utoronto.ca. That will be in the chat. And Carlo, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for your presentation.